Uh, it's um, really good to be back in, in Dublin. I, uh, I'm a Canadian. I live in New York City, but I'm a, um, I'm a Canadian. I say that for a couple of reasons. First of all, that Canadians and the Irish have always been good friends, so it's nice to be here. Second, I want you to know that I have bear no responsibility whatsoever for the madness that's happening in the United States right now. Although, um, as a Canadian, I will apologize. I'm sorry. <laughs> so very sorry. Um, so so uh, I want to uh, put another caveat before I start, and that is that I'm going to show you a bunch of work today. I'm going to try to use we, the word we as much as possible, and I'm going to try to specifically name people, but a good reminder that everything I'm talking about today comes out of a collaborative process. Like most of you in this room, nothing I do uh, happens alone. It happens with a group of people, and these are some of the really awesome um, people that are involved in some of the work that I'm going to show you. So I, I, I gave this talk the first time um, at the Library of Congress, and I told them it was going to be called Living in Data. And I guess they didn't like the name of that talk, so they renamed it to Making Meaning from Data. I said I didn't like that title, so they came back with, um, they came back with uh, um, Data and Humans, a Love Story, <laughs> which, well, sure, we'll go with that, right? Uh, but that talk really is about data and humans. Um, uh, most of us, I think, in this room spend a lot of time thinking about data, but maybe not as much uh, about humans. And we, we, we perch data on the bottom of this triangle, and I think we can distill everything we've been doing in the first decade of big data with this idea that the more data that we, we, cr we collect, the more wisdom we'll arrive with when we get up at the top. But something's gone wrong, I, I think, and, and part of that is that these systems that we build, we've thought a lot about the technical aspects of them, but not so much about what does it feel to live inside the, of them. And, and so this talk is really going to be about that. What does it feel to live inside of data systems, and how can we do a better job of making our data systems more livable? Um, in, in 1931, a sociologist named Jacob Moreno um, drew a diagram of the first, the first diagram of a social network. This is the social network of a seventh grade classroom. Boys on the left, girls on the right, two brave vectors of puberty crossing that gap. <laughs> I think a lot about this diagram because in 1930, well, 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 well before the big data era, in order to do this type of work, there was only one way to do it. You would have had to sit in the classroom and you would have had to observe the students. You know, and in doing so, you would have no choice but to notice that those squares and those triangles are in fact human beings. They are not squares and triangles. They are people with names and teenage body odors. And, and you would know these people um, as you went about doing this study. You know, flash forward to 2013 when a group of scientists in New England um, did a, a study. They pulled 600,000 tweets from the Twitter API. They ran them through sentiment analysis and created what they called sentiment maps of New York City. Uh, they did them for a variety of emotions, but the one that got the most attention was sadness. This is the sadness map of New York City. Um, the sadder parts are deeper purple. And if you look right above the reservoir in the middle, you'll see a deep, very deep purple dot. That is Hunter College High School. And so the authors of this paper decided that, um, oh, this is interesting, the saddest place in New York City is a high school. They looked at the calendar and they found out that their study had been done the week after everyone came back from spring break. It's a good thesis, right? So they ran with it. They published a story in uh, a paper in Science. Um, they ended up uh, in, the, in the New York Times. Um, and then later they realized they were wrong. They realized that their geotagging mechanism was faulty. It was about a few blocks off, so it wasn't the school, it was, some, it was somewhere else. Uh, and I actually sat down with the, with the vice principal of the school and I said, what, was, what did you think when this, um, this story came out? And she said, well, I knew it was wrong. I was like, well, did you know about the geotagging thing? She's like, no, my students don't use Twitter. Twitter is for old people, she said to me. <laughs> So I've been thinking about this a lot because this project is kind of, it's technically sophisticated, but they missed something really important that made the whole thing wrong. But I think they also missed the idea that the work they were doing in their lab in, in New England was in some way affecting these students whose data that they thought they were pulling from Twitter. It's this kind of um, turnaround, which I think is important to the um, central question of this talk, what is it like to live in data? And it also gives us my first answer, which is to live in data sucks. 
And I don't mean it all, only in the pejorative, I mean it also in the vacuum cleaner way, that to live in data is to be extracted from all of the time. It's happening to all of us right here at this very moment. Uh, in, 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 in 2009, um, I did a project uh, where, where i just been started on Twitter and I was excited about these tweets that people would post when they land in a new city. Right? They're mostly these weird kind of quotidian slices of people's lives. Sometimes there's some interesting things in there, but they're really kind of what we would normally think of as throwaway tweets. Except they contain a couple of interesting pieces of data. I know where they're landing and when, and I know probably where they're from um, because they tell me in their profile. So in 2009, I built this project called Just Landed, which scrapes Twitter. It pulls a whole bunch of tweets and then recreates a system of um, travel just based on those weird kind of thinly veiled show-off tweets. Um, and the sister project that I built the day after was a little um, more fun, a little, a little more whimsical. This is called Good Morning. This is um, everybody in Twitter saying good morning to each other one morning in 2009. Um, the green dots are people who wake up early in the morning. The red ones are people who wake up late. You can see laziness across the world here. <laughs> but I was doing something which, every, which at the same time was starting to be done by, a, by, by different powers, right? So advertisers were doing this. The military was doing this. We were realizing that these new social networks create a medium in which we can learn from and about people by sucking that data away from them. And so tangential to that, right next door to that, what is it like to live in data, uh, is to be used. Right? So in 1988, actually in the UK, um, somebody developed this, this really interesting idea called the Air Miles Program, which meant that when you went into a store, any store, you could give them a number that would, would give you air miles. And when, when, then when you went to get groceries, they would ask you for the same number. And then when you went to get gas, they would ask you for the same number. And what that allowed them to do was to track consumers. Uh, it was the beginning of something, right? Now, I, th I think we had somebody talking about CERN, right? Talking about CERN as the greatest science experiment in human history. Well, I would argue the greatest computational exper experiment in human history is ad tracking. And all of us are being tracked right now. All of our lives are being reconstructed in the hopes that we can place you a pretty good ad in the browser that you have a good chance of clicking on. Um, so... I, uh, um, had a, I teach at NYU. I had a student who, who was in my class. Her name is Julie Irwin. She's fantastic. She um, came up with this project um, called Cookie Jar. And the way the Cookie Jar works is that she would collect some ads from people that she knew that they were seeing in their browser. She would send those ads to strangers, and she would ask them to write a story about them based on their ads. So in the way, she was trying to reinver, reverse engineer the ad placement system. And whereas advertisers are trying to make a story about us, uh, or, or, or make some ads based on the story of us, she was doing the opposite. Can we make a story based on the ads that you see? Now, at the time, I was just starting a project. I was about eight months into the project uh, that allowed me to, to collect every ad that I saw in my browser. So this is all the ads that I saw a month in my browser. And so taking a cue from Julia, I sent these to 10 strangers, and I paid them $10 to write stories about me. And what I found out um, was that I was in my 20s, and I lived alone, <laughs> and uh, I played a lot of video games. Right? None of these things are true, but it's what advertisers thought about me. In many ways, it was what, were, what, the, what these decisions that were being made about me were based on. This one's a little true. Uh, and, you know, we, we sort of, I, I, I think that maybe with ad blockers all this stuff is going away, but that's not the truth at all. All of these exact same algorithms are starting to go out into even more problematic parts of our lives. So in, insurers are using these algorithms to understand how and at what level and at what price you should be insured. So these t same types of things are happening all day, every day, um, because of, mostly because of these devices in our pocket, but also because of some of our web interactions. So with Floodwatch, which is this tool that we were building, it allows you to look at your advertising profile and then compare it to either the average or to sort of any other demographic se selection. You can also do things like um, compare a demographic selection to another demographic selection, and what it allows you to, you to do is to look at this story that advertisers have concocted about you and to see how much of it you think is true and how much of it you think is false. 
And there's two things we're trying to do with this project concurrently. One is to build in some power to the user, right, so that they can have an understanding of what, um, is, what decisions are being made based on their data. And the other thing is that we're building the largest um, corpus of advertising data we hope that will ever be collected. And then instead of giving it to advertisers, we're going to give it to policy researchers who are trying to understand if and where there are discriminatory practices within advertising. Right? It's okay for an advertiser to advertise uh, to me be because they know I have glasses, but it's not okay for them to deny ads to somebody based on race or gender or a lot of other things that are protected um, in the U.S. under the Constitution. This is one of my favorite people. She's uh, um, an urbanist. She, is, she was, um, uh, lived in New York and then in Toronto. And when she was looking at the, uh, the state of cities in the 1950s, she remarked on this idea that we were creating these technological marvels, but they were missing the ability for people who live in the cities to have any impact on them whatsoever. And I think we're heading down a similar path with the things that we're creating, and that we're creating things that are pretty amazing, but they're not being built for people to talk back to them. They're not being built for people um, uh, to have a say, and the people that are inside of them are fundamentally without agency. So we, a project that I worked on um, in the UK was an attempt to try to look at that, and in some ways to offer an alternative. So the way that this project came about is, it's like, I got this email with, this is my favorite subject line for an email, if you ever want to um, get in touch with me, it said, um, do you want to talk about a strange idea over a pint? And I was like, yes, yeah, strange ideas, pints, those are two of my favorite things, let's do it. And so I met with a doctor named, William, uh, named Will, Will Dixon, who um, teaches at the University of Manchester, and he's a doctor, he's a, a rheumatologist, and he studies people with chronic pain. And one of the things that you probably all know about people with chronic pain is that, um, anecdotally anyways, there's a correspondence, uh, correlation between pain symptoms and the weather. But what I didn't know, which totally surprised me, is that there is no scientific study about this. We don't know if it's true or not. So we set out to recruit a group of UK chronic pain sufferers, and we designed a tool and a, ser and a series of data visualization interfaces that allowed them to, um, to keep track of what was happening um, with their pain symptoms. So this is part of the interface, a prototype interface that we built um, for the website that allowed people to go and look at their week of, of pain symptoms and compare them to everybody else who lived nearby. And the site itself provided this this um, deep exploratory interface for anybody to come in and explore their symptoms. But what it also did, and this is the interface that you're seeing right now, is it allowed people to also construct their own hypotheses. So what any of the participants in the study could do is they could say, hey, I think that my pain symptoms are tied to temperature. I think that as the temperature goes down, my pain gets worse. And I think it happens between one and two, two days afterward. And they can submit that hypothesis. So we set out um, with a pretty ambitious goal. These types of projects are hard to recruit for, so we wanted to get, um, we wanted at least 5,000 people to, um, to be involved with the project. We ended up with uh, almost 15,000 people participating in the project. Um, they, they, they filed their data and churned away these hypotheses um, for more than a year. And what I really love about this is that uh, it is a truly citizen science project in the way that we not only are, are doing science with, this, with citizens assisting, but we're giving the citizens the ability um, to play that role of a scientist. All right, what is it like to live in data? Well, I would say that one of the defining features for the everyday person to live in data is to be overwhelmed by the complexity of it all. We've heard a lot of numbers so far in the stage in this event, and those numbers are all pretty big. They're too big for our human sensorium to really get a sense of. So what can we do to help understand um, these systems better and to put them within that human sensorium? Well, for the last um, seven years or so, I've been building software tools, and I've been building software tools that are exploratory tools, and that these tools tend to do is not the usual thing that data visualization does, which is to try to take something complicated and make it more simple, but instead to do the opposite. Can we embrace the complexity of the system? So this is a tool that I built while I was at the New York Times called Cascade. It allows um, anybody to visualize every conversation that happens um, with New York Times content, and it allows it to happen in real time. 
Uh, after I built Cascade, we went on to build a number of projects which kind of share a, a central theme, and that is that these tools allow us to get what I would call the sort of street level or pub level, I guess, view of the data. It allows you to go in and actually see each individual data point. But at the same time, it allows you to see the high level, the 10,000 foot view, the satellite view of of the data where you're able to see pattern that you might not have otherwise been able to see. So here's a project that we built for Microsoft which allows uh, organizations to study meeting uh, behavior um, across the organization and across time. It's a touch space application so that um, people can, can dig in, uh, drill in deeply to, to look at pattern. Also for Microsoft, we built this project called um, Specimen Box, which is a tool that visualizes and sonifies data from large-scale botnets, allowing the researchers to have access to the data that's being created in real time, but to allow them to um, instinctively and, we hope, um, intuitively explore the data in ways that they wouldn't normally be able to do. And just recently, um, we finished a project uh, which visualizes the entirety of Twitter, and it does this in real time as well. And here you'll really see this difference between viewing the data from the high level view and viewing the data at the ground level. We get to not only see pattern in, 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 in the entirety of, of, of the um, millions and, and millions and millions of active users, but we also get to zoom down deep into Australian sports or German football or Filipino influencers to see exactly what's happening inside of these communities. Lately, though, even this has left me a little bit flat. And part of that is that these street views that I'm talking about are not actually street views. They're manufactured ones that get experienced by you or me or someone who looks like you and me uh, in a boardroom. So we decided to take the show on the road. This is a piece that we installed in Times Square in February. It was designed by um, two of my colleagues, Genevieve Hoffman and Noah Younts. It's called We Were Strangers Once Too, and what it is is it's a data sculpture based on immigration. From the front, it looks like a perfect heart, but from the back, it looks like a stacked bar chart. And what you're actually seeing is the entirety of the immigrant population in New York City presented to you in a way that you're not viewing on a screen, but instead you are walking through and between taking selfies with um, we were told that over the course of the exhibition, we should expect to see upwards of 100,000 people viewing this piece per hour, um, which meant that over the duration of the month, it was seen by millions and millions of people. I'll show you a little bit of video about what it actually looked like. This is the ninth annual Valentine's Heart, and it's particularly relevant that this year, we are trying to send a message of love rather than hate, Love rather than fear, which seem to be the themes of the day in so many different ways. When we were working on this project, I had this quote in my mind, which comes from an um, anthropologist named Arlie Hochschild. Uh, she does a lot of work in the American South. In fact, she spent nine years in the American South trying to understand what's behind this big divide that we see that's growing and I think is the result of some of the political madness that I mentioned earlier. And this quote really talked about this idea of, of building, uh, the necessity of building small bridges of human connection. And when I looked at this project, that's what I see it as. And part of the reason for this is that it occurs in real space. We could have done the exact same thing in VR, we could have done the exact same thing on the web, but by putting it in Times Square, we were forcing people out of the usual context that they experience data on a website or, or, or in, e in their email, and instead put it into a context of, of, of social interaction. Okay, so what is it like to live in data? To be used, to be without agency, to be overwhelmed by complexity. I don't think it's a good place to be right now, and I say that as a white male Canadian. Right? It's an even worse place to be for people who are already um, being discriminated against. It's a worse place to be um, for women, for people of color, uh, for the disabled, for the incarcerated, for refugees, so on and so on and so on. And I think one of the problems, the reasons why I'm up here talking about this is because it's my fault you know, that it's like this. You know, I've been working with data for 10 years, and when I say my fault, I mean our fault. We've all collectively made decisions that have led to this place that we're living in. So what can we do? Well, first, practically, 
There's a group that has been founded in New York City called AI Now. Um, they're based out of New York University, and about um, two weeks ago, they released their AI Now 2017 report, which provides 10 easy things that organizations can consider when they're building their data systems to make sure that these things don't end up being harmful. But I think there's a more personal answer to that, and that personal answer to it is to think about data through a lens of humanism, to think about data as a, through the lens of being a human being. Right? It comes back to this chart, to be reminded that the squares and circles and triangles and data points that we work with every day are very, very often human beings. And to understand that the way that we negotiate with them should resemble the way that we would negotiate with people in the real world, in the real space. We are building amazing things, really amazing things, but amazing does not mean livable. Right, this is Denver International Airport. It's one of the busiest airports in the world. Um, over 75,000 people fly in and out of Denver Airport every day. It's a technological marvel. It's amazing, but it's terrible to experience. Right, airports are amazing, but as a place to live, as a place to be a human being, not so much. So what I'm hoping is this, and that is that maybe when you're sitting in the airport on your way out of this conference, and you're thinking about the next amazing thing you're going to build, thinking about what the data pipeline's going to be like, how you're going to train your adversarial neural network, you can also add another question into your brain, which is, how do we make this more livable? How do we make these systems a place that we want to live? Thank you.